Um, I want to give a real quick thanks to the NYU Humanities Initiative for um, helping to pay the costs of this conference. And um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the chair of the NYU Center for Bioethics, Bill Ruddick, who is going to provide an official welcome, and he's going to also introduce our first speaker. So without further ado, again, Bill Ruddick. Um, so um, I guess the official welcome includes the fact that this is uh, the first conference that the Center for Bioethics and jointly the Center for Environmental Studies has put on. We do have monthly um, staff and, um, workshops and public lectures. Um, but this is, although for the several years that we've been in existence, we've talked about a conference, this is the first one, and uh, everyone played an important part, Ben, ben especially. And we hope there will be more to follow. Um, the topic seems especially suited to the center's aim to, in various ways, combine the, and contrast the moral issues that arise both in health and medical matters on the one hand and environmental uh, issues on the other. As a matter of fact, we don't think it's a matter of on the one hand or on the other. Um, in some religions, um, individual lives are given infinite value, or at least the lives of the faithful. Um, in military theory, planning and execution, the lives of one's own troops are given high but nonetheless determinate value, uh, while the lives of one's enemies are given often high negative value, and the lives of non-combatants uh, may be given some value, no value, or negative value in operations of shock and awe. In some philosophical quarters, efforts are made to define and endorse meaningful as opposed to meaningless lives, or in the current catchphrase, uh, lives that go well um, versus lives if you're not. Uh, but it, I think it's in matters of medical health and environmental policy that there is perhaps, there's come to be uh, in the last several decades, the most discriminating judgments uh, about the value of lives with arguments for and against assigning or finding differing, often quantified values for lives at, the, at their beginning, uh, or around young lives, or lives at aged lives, or lives that are concluding, um, or lives with or without health, physical, and cognitive abilities, or lives that are put at risk. These are just some of the dis differences that have been raised as making a difference to the value of lives in individual decisions or pol policies. Uh, um, I take it the, the papers presented today will advance reflections on some of these discriminations uh, as well as, I trust, discussion. We're most fortunate actually, in having Dan Brock to begin the day. No one that I can think of has thought more carefully, more widely, more clearly, and sensibly about a remarkable range of topics about, especially the beginning, beginning and end of life. And um, he has uh, written and lectured widely in ways that have had considerable influence both within the academy and without. And one of the reasons is that his writings have been informed almost from the beginning by 
remarkable engagement uh, in various national and international commissions, uh, as well as very close ties to hospitals and medical schools, first for a number of years at Brown, and then more recently at Harvard. He is currently the uh, a professor of medical ethics at Harvard and director of the division of medical ethics at Harvard. In short, we couldn't have asked for, let alone hoped for, uh, a better person to survey current thought. And I happily cede the rest of my 15 minutes to the, the, the very good gentle person from Cambridge. Uh, you, don't, you don't know it probably, but um, I've, I have some weak causal responsibility for this program because the dean, I think who raised some of the money, Dick Foley, yeah. for it, yeah. uh, was my first graduate student that I supervised at Brown many years <laughs> <Fantastic>. ago. <laughs> he's now, uh, he, he's, he, last time I saw him, he said he's now vice chancellor for strategic planning and that's uh, in the absence of there being any chancellor. So big vice chancellor is, you don't have to report to anybody. Uh, one of my friends from President's Commission many, many years ago is here this morning and she said she came down to see what I was thinking and I told her um, mistake <laughs> uh, because I really, uh, I, I was, what I was asked to do this morning was just to provide some background to this broad area in particular for people who uh, hadn't been working in it. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look down here with some frequency because I don't have any of the slides here. <laughs> the cord wasn't long enough. But um, so that was, that was the title I was actually uh, given. Uh, and I'll see what I can do with it. Um, That, that tells you in part what I just said. The issues will be how we, that I'll focus on, will be how we uh, value um, saving or prolonging uh, lives. And in the past, this has generally been the province of, uh, if you go back certainly several decades, the province of uh, economists because of its uh, practical importance, because its use in um, government regulatory context. Uh, so for environmental regulations that save lives, the issue is which, are, which of those are worth their cost. And uh, formal analyses have to be now given um, uh, for government regulations to show that they are, by some standard, worth their cost. For healthcare resource prioritization, it's a matter of once we give up this notion that we can buy everything that will help people, then we have to prioritize and make decisions about what uh, should be spent. In particular, uh, what I'll focus on this morning is um, life-saving. Uh, over the last couple of decades, um, philosophers have uh, joined in these discussions. Uh, uh, if you go back 30 years ago, they had not been uh, saying much of anything about these, year, uh, about these issues. Uh, but that's broadened, the, uh, I think, the issues quite considerably. And in particular, um, uh, it's broadened them to raise some equity issues which strictly aren't value of life issues, but they bear on making value of life assessments and what we're going to do with them in uh, policy contexts. Uh, now, f among the economists, the early measures, if you go back several decades that were used, were called human capital or um, lost earning measures. Uh, these uh, measures me th these, uh, measured the economic loss to others or to the economy of somebody's death. Uh, so what it does to the economy if I die probably helps it. <laughs> uh, but um, that was what the measure was. Uh, now even for the loss to others of a person's death, this missed uh, something important. Namely, think about the loss of a loved one uh, and uh, uh, however one calculates that or however one thinks about it, uh, we don't typically think about it in terms of 
what's the economic loss to the economy of my wife dying or uh, something of that sort. So it makes value, the value of life only economic value. And of course, that means it varies with productivity as well. So you have a certain kind of inequality, which um, is problematic. And it misses the loss to the individual uh, of premature death. Um, if I was to be told that I've got an illness that I'll die of tomorrow, I, I confess one of the things I wouldn't worry about is the economic loss <laughs> Uh, to the economy, even if there was going to be one. Now, the common measure that economists now use is uh, uh, typically some form of willingness to pay measure, uh, using contingent valuation to elicit preferences or analyses of the differences in the labor market when there are specific uh, risks to death. Um, uh, Kip Fiscusi has done a lot of the um, economic analysis producing these um, measures. There was recently, some of you may have seen in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, uh, that um, there was an article about how much your life is worth depends on which agency <laughs> is, uh, is uh, deciding to, to value it. And uh, the standard measure that had been used uh, mostly was $7 million for the value of a statistical life. Now, Viscusi says that anything less than nine is um, uh, although I wonder about the basis, but in any, any event, they're, they're ratcheting it up some. Uh, so now um, this uh, willingness to pay measure results in something like a seven to nine million uh, dollar value of a statistical life. Now, in the health sector, as probably everyone here knows, the usual measure of value for health programs is some version of quality adjusted life years or qualies. Uh, that has two components, the two things that we really use healthcare to try to do, uh, namely prolongation of life or life years. Uh, but those life years are adjusted for what's usually called the health related quality of those life years. That means it won't have all quality adjustments, but it will have health related quality adjustments. Um, and the other, besides prolongation of life, the other thing is obviously improvement in health-related quality of life. Um, now, uh, that's the way uh, it, the value is typically measured uh, in the health context, the value of different programs. Uh, maximizing benefits, then, by this value measure is, is one of two broad goals uh, for health resource prioritization. But it's only one of two. Um, so the, uh, the other broad goal, as everyone here again I think knows, is um, to distribute those benefits. The, the first goal is to maximize those uh, benefits measured in qualities. The second is to distribute those benefits uh, as well as the costs of, of, of getting them uh, equitably across the society. And that's where the philosophers have uh, jumped in and said we have something to say about that too. Um, Cost-effectiveness analysis is the analytic method to determine what will maximize benefits or value, uh, as, again, probably well known to everyone here. But CEA, in my view, ignores issues of equity or fairness. And the equity issues have become part of the value of life disc discourse um, in the, the title that I was given to talk about. So one of the things I'm going to talk about is what are some uh, only some of the equity issues, and what are some of the other issues besides simply doing CEAs to uh, evaluate different programs. So one of the issues that's attracted a number of atten uh, considerable attention is how should states of health and disability be evaluated? Uh, in particular, how can we quantify different he health states so we can tell how important a gain did we get when we went from here to there. Um, they're typically evaluated on a zero to one scale, with zero being death. Uh, but there's room for states worse than death in these measures. Uh, and uh, one being full health. And then the, um, the values of various health states or disability states of limited health or disability are determined by people's preferences for being in those states as opposed to being either dead or uh, in full health. Uh, 
One of the issues uh, that's gotten a lot of attention is whose preferences do we use to um, evaluate health states? And uh, one of the reasons that's uh, a significant question is that uh, nor so what I'll call normal functioning persons evaluate life in a particular state of disability as worse than those who actually have or experience that disability. Uh, now that's not true in every instance, but it certainly, if you look at the bulk of the literature, there is that difference. And the one interesting, so that means if you, if you ask people who are suffering the disability, you'll get different answers to uh, the preference evaluations uh, than if you ask so-called normal functioning people. Why is that? Uh, I don't know why that three got in there, but <laughs> uh, it's from, um, it in part is from simply the false beliefs and prejudices and stereotypes that those of us without disabilities, I actually am no longer one of those, but those of us, persons without disability have about what it's like to uh, have a particular disability. Now, um, it's, it's not just from these, but these are things we would want to correct for, right? Uh, if, if I evaluate the state on the basis of false beliefs about what it's like or prejudices against people like that or stereotypes I have about what it's like to, be, to have disability uh, X. Those are things we would want to correct for. Those are just epistemic mistakes that people are making. But there are also um, other factors here that have been given a lot of note um, for some time now, uh, what I've called accommodation, coping, and adjustment. Uh, the way people adjust to their disabilities um, they, um, they learn to perform uh, uh, functions uh, that they could no longer perform in the same way they did before the disability uh, in a new way. They um, uh, cope in the sense of uh, change their expectations about what's adequate functioning, um, and they adjust their plans of life to uh, the, um, uh, to the, um, disability they have. My favorite example of coping, because it's my personal example, is uh, I have MS and it means I wear a brace on one leg, uh, on the right leg, and so it keeps my foot from dropping and my keeps, theoretically it keeps me from stumbling. It doesn't actually, all, <laughs> but it does sometimes. Um, but when you drive a car, of course, what do you do with your right foot? You put it <laughs> on the accelerator and on the brake. So uh, I learned in a week to simply drive with the other foot. And I just tuck my, what for all of you is your driving foot up against the, <laughs> up against the uh, seat and I drive with the left, left foot. So I'm doing the same thing but in a new way. Now, um, why does it matter then, uh, what, what are the implications of this difference in preferences? Well, the implications are that if we use the preferences of disabled people, what do we do? We undervalue prevention because basically they say it's not as bad as you, you thought it was. And we undervalue uh, rehabilitation because you're not closing as big a gap as uh, you thought. On the other hand, if you use normal preferences, you, it looks like you're going to undervalue life-saving, at least for the disabled, There's more implications as well, but because uh, you will uh, use evaluations of their health-related quality of life with their, which are lower than the evaluations of the people that um, actually have those disabilities. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, this issue. Uh, actually, Paul was one of the authors of one of the best papers uh, on this. Uh, it's a complicated issue um, that remains unsettled uh, uh, in the literature. There's also a question um, uh, Chris Murray's group out at Washington, uh, it's the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, and they're doing health evaluations on a global scale. Well, if you do it on a global scale, then there's, there's the question of whether there's any common evaluative framework for health states across very different uh, social, cultural, and economic conditions. Now, in fact, they've done some work which suggests that um, 
the differences that people give in these different contexts are uh, less than intuitively, at least uh, I would have thought, and, and less than intuitively many would have thought. But nevertheless, that's one of the issues if one's going to have a, a measure of the global burden of disease across the world, which is one of the things they're doing. Um, another interesting issue uh, is, uh, should qualities be age-weighted? Uh, basically, what do we do with the fact that people who um, uh, receive health benefits or health uh, losses, for that matter, uh, receive them at different times in their lives? Uh, CEAs generally reject age weighting of qualities. So what they'll say is each year of life gained counts the same in terms of its value regardless of the age of the recipient. Now, the age of the recipient may correlate with other things like um, uh, general uh, uh, disabilities that come with aging, but then you, 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 you don't have to appeal to age there, you appeal to the disability itself. Um, the, um, that, was, that, that has been the standard uh, uh, use in uh, cost-effectiveness analyses. Uh, <coughs> in the work that was done um, for the World Bank, World uh, WHO study, investing in health way back in 1993, they used the measure of Dolly's uh, D, disability adjusted life years, and basically you want more qualities and fewer Dollies, uh, and that's the main difference between them. Um, they did age weighting, but, but for ethically problematic reasons, I think. Um, they said this, they justified age weighting, and the age weighting they used was less value to uh, f health gains that come to either the very young or the very old. And, <coughs> excuse me, that was because of what they call the social, economic, and psychological dependence of the very young and of the very old uh, on persons in their productive life years. Uh, now, what's problematic about this, of course, is it values the health of persons according to their instrumental value to others. And while we may want to be interested in that, we certainly don't want to be uh, only interested in that. And uh, we may want to, uh, in fact, uh, not take account of that phenomenon. Um, there is a different rationale, which uh, persuades me, <laughs> for whatever that's worth. There is a different rationale for age weighting than, than one the um, uh, the WHO folks uh, gave. It's, it's usually called a fairness or a fair innings rationale. Uh, it's often attributed to Alan Williams, a health economist, died a few years ago at uh, York University in England. And here, um, the idea here was a, li a year of life extension has greater moral value uh, the younger its recipient. Now, there's some complications to be added to this, but. Uh, this is generally a once over lightly talk, as you've noticed by now. Um, so the idea here is you, you in, in competition for health benefits, you give to those who, if they're not helped, will have had, le will have had less of the good your resource would provide. Uh, I, I take this to be an aspect of priority to the worst off, um, but the idea is then you people have a claim in grounds of fairness for living a full human lifespan. Uh, and the further one is from getting to that full lifespan, the higher the moral importance is of getting them closer to it. So uh, a higher moral priority to reaching the normal lifespan than, for example, to, to, to living beyond it. And this is uh, interestingly Well, just this is different than preferring the young for the fact that other things equal, if we provide life-saving interventions for the young, they'll have a higher life expectancy and so we get a greater benefit in qualities. Uh, that rationale looks forward and says, what's the benefit likely to be? The fair innings rationale looks back and says, how much will the person have had uh, if they don't get treated? And then we prefer those who will have had less if they don't get treated. So it's, it's different than simply uh, looking at the potential benefits 
and saying the young have a greater potential benefit. It's been criticized as, um, age weighting has been criticized uh, widely and, and is generally not adopted by most policy uh, folks. Uh, it's been criticized as unfair age discrimination against the elderly. Uh, I think the fair innings justification it's problematic to criticize it as unfair age discrimination against the elderly because exactly what the rationale is, is a rationale in terms of fairness. Uh, so on, on this view, an additional life year to the, uh, to the younger has greater moral value than an additional life year to someone like me. So I'm arguing against my interests, I point out. <laughs> Another issue that is very important in this area uh, Cass Sunstein, who went down to be, I'm not sure, I, I can't remember exactly the, the name of the uh, organization he heads up, but basically it's the government organization that deals with regulation. Cass was quoted uh, uh, several months ago as saying the most important issue that they were facing was discounting uh, in terms of its impact on their evaluation of regulations. Uh, this is uh, an ethical, not just an economic issue. Uh, it has special importance, I'll say what it is if some of you don't know what it is in a moment, but it has special importance for many environmental issues. Uh, in general, I know much less about environmental issues than I do about health issues, uh, but it has special importance for many environmental issues where the harmful effect will only occur in the distant future. What do we do with nuclear waste and things like that? But it's also important for valuing in the health sector preventive versus acute care. Uh, and it's important for evaluating uh, the value of health benefits that will come to uh, future generations, not just current generations. Now, uh, there's no disagreement that monetary costs and benefits in different programs should be discounted. Um, the idea here is we'll apply a discount rate, say 3% or 5%, and um, st stretched over whatever the time of the program is, so that if we get um, $1,000 in 10 years, that's worth less than $1,000 that we get today because we have to discount it that we don't have it those 10 years, and we could have used it to invest and get 3 or 5% or whatever during that time. So there's no disagreement that monetary costs and benefits should be discounted. The issue is whether health benefits should be as well. Um, my own view is the answer to that is no, they shouldn't be. But um, that still leaves us with a bunch of problems, but nevertheless, the question is why should the same health gain for an individual have, to have less value merely because it occurs in the future as opposed to now? So suppose we have the following uh, uh, case. We have to spend resources that we have now on one of two alternative programs. One is an acute care program, which will save 100 lives now. The other is a preventive care program, which will save 125 lives in 20 years. If we have a, five uh, if we have a 3 or 5 percent discount rate, then the discounted value of the fr uh, first program is greater than the discounted value of the second program, even though the second program, in fact, saves more lives. I never checked to see whether this was true, but Derek Parfit calculated at one point that with a 5% discount rate, which is higher than normally recommended nowadays, three is what's recommended, but five was often used. With a 5% discount rate, one life year now is worth more than a billion life years in 400 years. Now, that simply can't be right, uh, in my view. Uh, and so we don't want discounting that implies that, and the standard mode of discounting does imply that. It's, uh, let me see if I, uh, okay. So one other point I want to make that I guess isn't on the slide, but um, it, you can see it in the example I gave you. Uh, if we compare uh, preventive programs uh, like changes of behavior, some vaccination programs and so forth, we have to act now, but we know that benefit doesn't come for 20 or 30 years. If you eat a healthier diet than you have been, uh, that may improve your health future, but not right away in most cases. Uh, what that means is that if you compare it with acute care interventions, 
um, we will systematically devalue health benefits that we get by preventive programs as opposed to acute care programs. And of course, that's actually what we do <laughs> uh, uh, when you look around and see uh, the School of Public Health, which is engaged in mostly prevention, gets a lot less money than the medical school at any institution like this, which is engaged in acute care. So it, it uh, has a big impact uh, whether one discounts, and if so, at what rate, has a big impact on evaluating programs within the health sector. Um, my own view is equity requires equal concern for all persons, uh, independent of which generation they belong to and that rationality requires equal concern for all periods of one's life. Uh, I, now I simply state those assertions. <laughs> uh, an, another interesting issue, at least to me, uh, is do the benefits that come to other people affect the value of producing equality for one per person or one patient? Um, so when we think about the, the benefits of health programs, uh, should they be restricted to the health benefits of those programs, or uh, should they include other non-health benefits, uh, like uh, economic benefits of the program? In particular, when we're valuing uh, uh, prolonging lives, uh, one of the things that happens, presumably, is prolonging lives, and we have to figure out what that's worth. But then there are other uh, significant effects of doing that. The practical importance of this issue is that these indirect non-health benefits can sometimes swamp the direct health benefits of the health programs. So advocates for particular, uh, for meeting particular health needs, they often appeal to these indirect non-health benefits of meeting them. For example, in treating substance abuse, we get told the great economic costs of substance abuse, the psychological costs to family members and so forth, all this apart from the benefit that comes to uh, the person with substance abuse. So the question is, um, do we simply, uh, in evaluating programs, do we simply restrict the evaluation to the health benefit to the individual treated, or do we look to the broader uh, effects? There is a, a fairly straightforward moral argument for considering all costs and benefits. Basically what it is is that these indirect non-health benefits to others are real benefits and costs of the program. Uh, so if you ignore them, uh, doing so has opportunity costs. You'll fail to identify the most cost-effective use of your resources. So we would need a reason for ignoring them, uh, given this sketch of a consideration for taking them account of them. And uh, the reason I think that's most persuasive is a fairness objection, namely that it's, uh, this draws on some of John Broome's account, of, of fairness, but it's unfair to favor some patients or some healthcare needs over others merely because it, they produce uh, non-health benefits to other persons, like the employer of the person who has a substance abuse problem. If, he if healthcare needs are equal, then uh, one can perhaps make a case that people have equal moral claims to have them met. Uh, so treating, if we uh, do this, of course, then we say uh, uh, treating working age substance abusers benefits their employers, benefits the economy, uh, treating retired substance abusers doesn't, so that looks to be to many an unpalatable implication of, uh, of this issue. Um, somebody's got to just tell me when to stop talking and I'll stop talking. Uh, there's a problem, Norm Daniels wrote a paper 20 years ago, uh, or maybe more now, uh, that he called uh, some several unsolved rationing problems. And one of those was what he called the aggregation problem. Someone has written a book on that issue who's sitting only a couple rows, <laughs> a rows back here. Uh, <laughs> I have a draft. <laughs> um, so cost effectiveness and older utilitarianism uh, puts no limit on how you aggregate uh, different size benefits to different persons. All that matters is the aggregate benefit of alternative programs. Now, in fact, that is in conflict with many people's ordinary 
uh, intuitions when they're asked to evaluate alternative health programs. Most people prefer large individual benefits, especially if they include life savings, to even greater in the aggregate, uh, very small benefits going to a large number of individuals. So there's a possible principle one might uh, try to develop here. Um, uh, Larry Temkin has a paper arguing for this, um, that we want to concentrate the benefits, concentrate them in the sense of uh, get them to a smaller number of people, but have them be bigger benefits. Why? Because they matter more then. Uh, and we want to disperse the burdens or losses. Uh, that's one possible principle one could try to develop here. The general issue is, uh, and it's a very hard issue, Francis Cam, who's I guess going to be around later today, has written the best stuff on this, I think, is when is aggregation ethical, when is it not, and of course for what reasons. Uh, very hard problem. <laughs> the priority view is something that I've mentioned uh, already, so no need to say much about it today, now, and at least one of the papers today will be uh, on this. But the priority view essentially says benefiting people matters more the worse off those people are. That's Derek Parfit's <coughs> uh, formulation of it. I won't go into the leveling down objection, but it's been, it's, it's been favored by the, the priority view has been favored by many because it doesn't, it avoids the leveling down objection. Uh, we saw the priority view in the preference for the young in life support. Um, why they will, uh, the worse off people are in terms of uh, years of life is the younger they are. So um, that argument that I sort of sketched uh, was an example of the priority view. Now let me just see if we can, well, I, w I will say something about this and then I'll stop uh, because th th there will also be another uh, paper on this in the meeting today. Um, but it's been a lot of discussion about whether maximizing value uh, in health resource allocation uh, results in discrimination against the disabled. And uh, the w reasons it seemed to do that is, well, many persons with significant disabilities have either lower life expectancies as a result of those disabilities, or they have a, lower, a significantly lower health-related quality of life. If we then look at life support directed to disabled persons, it produces less value, fewer qualities, uh, than for, that should be non-disabled persons, <coughs> than for non-disabled persons with the same health care needs. And notice it's, a, it's the disability that results in the lesser value because of the disability that results in l lower life expectancy, lower health-related quality of life. Now, alternative positions that people have explored here uh, include uh, uh, arguments to justify disregarding uh, either part or all of this uh, difference. So, for example, so long as disabled person's quality of life is acceptable to her, uh, then her lower quality of life shouldn't, account, uh, shouldn't count against her for life saving. And you can say the same thing for, um, for uh, uh, differences in life expectancy. So, conclusion. <laughs> um, what, what I've tried to do is just cover some of the issues in this broad discourse on valuing lives and extending life. Obviously, none of them in any detail. <clears throat> there are other important ones that I haven't even mentioned. Uh, one of my favorites is the fair chances versus best outcomes issue. Uh, it's a rich series of issues about valuing lives in the current debate. Uh, it's important because of practical implications, and I think it's rich in the philosophical issues that get raised. So that's why it fascinates some of us. Thank you.